here for the profession of faith of Brandon and Drew, as well as for the time of celebration that we will have with some of our couples who are anticipating marriage after the service. We're just so thankful for these milestones of life that we get to celebrate as a congregation as we finish this day together of worship to God. With those words of welcome to each of us tonight, we can have us just bow our heads and open the service in prayer. Heavenly Father, we're thankful that you are a God who calls us to weep with those who weep. There is no one in this place, no matter how broken we are, who is alone. For you have gathered around each of us this body to carry one another's loads. Now we thank you, Lord, that you are also a God who calls us to rejoice with those who rejoice. And today we rejoice with the Rigdon Hill and Visser families at the step of faith of their sons. We rejoice with these couples as they anticipate the step of faith and commitment of marriage. And Lord, as we rejoice with these families, we thank you also that you are a God who leads us forward. So we pray that your Holy Spirit would move among us tonight, that you would quiet the voices of doubt or distraction, that you would help us to hear clearly your word, to praise you with a full heart, to lift our prayers to you with deep honesty, and in all these things to glorify your name. Father, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, would you please stand for our call to worship. Today is kind of a mini Ascension Day evening. We're going to sing some of the songs of Ascension in this great season of the church year. And our call to worship reminds us of the glory of our risen Savior. This is from Revelation chapter 5. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. That every creature in heaven and earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying, to the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Friends, as we reflect that the Lamb that was slain is now seated on the throne, let's sing together that song of creation, crown him with many crowns, number 410. We'll sing stanza one through three. our triune God greets us with these words. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each of you, now and forevermore. Amen. As God's holy people gathered in his holy presence, please turn and greet those around you, especially our guests this evening.
Friends, let's remain standing in two pages back from what we just are. Another Ascension Day song, Rejoice the Lord is King, number 408. We'll sing stanza one, two, and four, number 408. You may be seated. The Lord is King. His kingdom is His realm that expands through the universe, all that He made. But also His kingdom was made up of subjects. And today we have two of His creation, two young men who are going to stand before us and profess that indeed He is not just the King of creation, but He is their King. Because when Brandon and Drew were baptized, God received them into His covenant family Today they want to be uh, welcomed officially at the table of the Lord. They want to profess their faith publicly in Jesus Christ as Savior. And they want to commit themselves before us to grow with Him for the rest of their lives. And with that before us, I'd like to invite Brandon and Drew up to answer these four vows. Brandon Drew, I still remember when I made profession of faith, we actually had to all sit facing the congregation the whole service, and they called us up one by one. It was very traumatic, so I remember. So I was trying to think, how can I make this traumatic so you remember? (laughs) You're worried now, aren't you? (laughs) I've had the privilege this past year of teaching you guys senior catechism and the past nine years of watching you grow, and I know for both of you, sports is a big part of your life, and just to think about the image I gave your peers last week, that this right now is not the end of the period, it's not the end of the game. This is the opening whistle, right? This is the opening pitch. This is the beginning of this journey that God's going to lead you on. And as you begin that journey, I'm going to ask each of you these four questions, which are called vows. And after the service tonight, we're going to have that celebration with the couples who are getting married. You might know someone who's going to be getting married, Drew. I'm not sure. Um, You know, they're going to make vows, and they actually just have to make one vow. You're making four, but these are promises before God's people, but more importantly, before God. And with that weight, I want you to respond to these questions. First of all, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent to redeem the world, and do you love and trust him as the one who saves you from your sin? And do you with repentance and joy embrace him as Lord of your life? Brandon, what is your answer? Drew, what is your answer? The next question relates to the Bible. Do you believe that the Bible is the word of God revealing Christ and his redemption and that the confessions of this church faithfully reflect that revelation? Drew, what is your answer? And Brandon, what is your answer? Third, do you accept the gracious promise of God made to you at your baptism? And do you affirm your union with Christ and his church, which your baptism signifies? Brandon and Drew. And then finally this. You promise to do all that you can 
with the help of the Holy Spirit, to strengthen your love and commitment to Christ by sharing faithfully in the life of the church, honoring and submitting to its authority, and to join with the people of God in doing the work of God everywhere. Drew Brigden Hill, what is your answer? And Brandon Visser, what is your answer? Very good. Congregation, we have heard these young men make these vows before God and before us, God's people. I invite you also to stand to receive them, if you're able to stand. Congregation of Jesus Christ, we welcome Brandon and Drew in love, and we promise to continue to pray for them and to support them by your word and example in their walk of discipleship in Jesus Christ. Congregation at Bethel, what is our answer? We do God helping us. Amen. You may be seated. You see this group of brothers and sisters out here, they are now officially welcoming you to all the privileges of full communion. I welcome you also to full participation in the life of the church. I welcome you to its responsibilities, its joys, and its sufferings. And may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead that great shepherd of our sheep, Jesus Christ, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, now and forever. That is our prayer. I'd like to pray over you, and I'd like to invite, if there are, again, any family or youth leaders, close friends, anyone who would like to come up and pray with Brandon and Drew to come and join me for this prayer over them as they take this step. So come up now. If you guys want to just maybe step in front of the baptismal font, and we'll gather behind you. Friends, again, let's please join us in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Brandon and for Drew. Before the foundations of the world, before the first star burst into the darkness with blazing light, that you knew them, that you knew their names, and that even each of the days ordained for them, including this evening, were written in your book before one of them came to be. We thank you for the promise that you made to each of them and to their families at baptism to welcome them into your covenant community, to embrace them and now through these years of formation to bring them to this day, this day of your choosing where they have now professed before us that indeed you are their Savior and Lord. Holy Father, we pray that by the power of your name you would now keep them from evil and temptation. Holy Spirit, may you equip them for everything good for doing your will. Lord Jesus, may you lead them on the way that you have chosen for them and may they find in the fellowship of your body the deep love of your people. Holy Father, we pray that you would give them a sense in these coming years as they leave high school now and go on to new things, that you already have prepared people and friends and places of service, and that they would just find that you are a God who leads and a God who is faithful. Father, we thank you with their family and their friends gathered here for the faithfulness that they also experience in this day. We pray this all in Jesus' name and all God's people say, amen. You stay here. We want to give you a couple of gifts um, to just commemorate this day. So, Drew, this is a, a Bible, and on the front of it is your favorite verse from the Sermon on the Mount, calling us not to worry, to know that God numbers the hairs of our head, and that each day has enough trouble of its own, which is a reminder that each day has a God who made it. So, welcome. Brandon, this is your Bible, and it has uh, Proverbs 3, reminding you to trust the Lord with all of your heart, to lean not in your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. So welcome to you as well. Yeah, praise God. And as they go to their seats, we're going to sing a song reminding us that in all the seasons of life, we praise the name of the God who saved us. Let's sing together. Blessed be your name.
Saying, Blessed be your name, and now we turn to reflect on the blessedness of that name. Parenthetically, I wonder if we ever could be a peninsula as a church because we always have trouble with bridges. It seems like um, we have trouble with those things. I'd like to invite you to turn with me. Uh, we're going to be in Philippians this evening, Philippians chapter 2, a very familiar passage of Scripture. We're going to read just verses 5 through 11 of that chapter. It's found on page 1088 in our Pew Bibles. I invite you to open that. We're also going to be in Lord's Day 36 tonight in the Heidelberg Catechism, which is a teaching of this church, of Reformed churches around the world. And we're in today what's called Lord's Day 36. It's broken up into 52 readings for each of the weeks of the year. We're on week 36 now on the third commandment, and that is found in our Grace Altar hymnals on page 873. We'll be reading that together. We are in the section of the Catechism dealing with the Ten Commandments, if you're a guest with us. And we began that examination of the Ten Commandments recognizing that for many of us, we think of the Ten Commandments as just a generic morality. It's just a basic kind of human decency, how to be a good person. And yet we've seen that the Ten Commandments are nothing generic or simply basic morality about them. In fact, they're deeply religious, which is why that first commandment tells us to worship the right God, and then the second commandment tells us to worship God rightly. These are deeply faith-filled descriptions of how God intended life to be. Now, one interesting thing, if you're not familiar with the catechism, there are, of course, 10 commandments, but there are 11 Lord's Days on the commandments, meaning that one of the 10 and only one of them gets two weeks' attention. And you might wonder, which would be the one? Maybe that first commandment, of course, telling us to worship the right God. That would be very important. Or maybe we would think that it would have something to do with the sins that we are prone to. Like maybe adultery needs two of them. Or maybe killing is such a big thing, we need to spend two weeks on that. But actually, of the Ten Commandments, the only one that gets two weeks treatment is this one, the third commandment on taking God's name in vain. Lord's Day 36, which we're going to deal with tonight, is really inviting us to speak with reverence when we speak about God. And then 37 is going to invite us to speak honestly when we speak to others. 36, speaking reverently to or about God. 37, speaking honestly to one another. Now, it's interesting when you read commentators, they're often apologetic that the catechism spends two weeks on this commandment, recognizing that this is historically bound, they were trying to chart a middle way between Catholics who they thought did not make enough of God's name and Anabaptists who were a little bit too afraid of it. And so they gave two different Lord's Days and they're apologetic about why we still have to deal with them. But I think actually this is very contemporary. We live in a world of foul language and fake news. And maybe it's helpful to spend a Sunday learning again how to speak reverently about God's name tonight And then at the end of my sabbatical when I come back, how to speak truthfully in a world of fake news to one another. So again, we're going to be reflecting on those things this evening. And as we do, I'd like to invite you to read with me Lord's Day 36. I'm going to read the two questions and invite you to join me in the answer. Brothers and sisters, what is God's will for us in the third commandment? That we neither blaspheme nor misuse the name of God by cursing, perjury, or unnecessary oaths, nor share in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. In a word, it requires that we use the holy name of God only with reverence and awe, so that we may properly confess Him, pray to Him, and praise Him in everything we do and say. Is blasphemy against God's name by swearing and cursing really such serious sin that God is angry also with those who do not do all they can to help prevent it and forbid it? Yes, indeed. No sin is greater. No sin makes God more angry than blaspheming his name. That is why he commanded the death penalty for it. 
With that teaching, we go to God's word. Before we do, would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the reminder tonight that words matter. That you've given us a great power in our tongues. The power to tear down our neighbor and the power even to exalt you, our creator. Heavenly Father, we thank you also for the power, not just of our words, but the power of your word. This word that created the galaxies and also this name that you have spoken by which we may know you and call to you in prayer and lift our praises to you in worship. Holy Father, once again, by the power of your Spirit, may your words come alive to us and may you shape, this, shape us by them. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Friends, your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider Equality with God, something to be grasped, but made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, as I mentioned at the beginning of the Sunday this morning, this is Ascension Day weekend. You'd be forgiven if you didn't notice on Thursday that it was Ascension Day. In the secular world we live in, there's no note of that. And even in many of our churches, including in this one, We don't worship anymore on Ascension Day, and often it's very easy to even go through this Sunday after Ascension Day without taking note of it. And yet this is an important part of the church calendar because this is when we remember that the one who descended has also ascended, that the one who was humbled is now exalted, that the one who was crucified is now glorified. And as I said this morning, that is a cosmic event. And what I'd like to do this evening is take that cosmic event and ask very simply, this isn't a complex sermon, what does that mean for our ordinary lives? What does Ascension Day mean to our everyday? And I specifically want to reflect on what does Ascension Day mean for something as pedestrian and simple as our entertainment choices and the ways that we speak when we text our friends and we go to the job site tomorrow morning, what does Ascension Day mean for our ordinary everyday? As we think about that question, we go to this familiar text, which is especially familiar because it tells a very familiar story. Ephesians 2 is a brief biography of Jesus' life. And so there is this song or poem that we read a portion of, and really verses 6 through 8, those first three stanzas of the poem, tell of Jesus' humility. And they really navigate those two great events of his life, his birth and his death, Christmas and Good Friday. Notice again the language of the poem. Who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, Christmas. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross, Good Friday. But then the next stanza, stanzas 4 through 6, which are verses 9 through 11, move from that humility to exaltation and again move through the biography of Jesus. In this case, briefly Easter and then Ascension Day. Notice again the language that God exalted him to the highest place. That's the image from the Gospel of Luke and then also in Acts 1 of Jesus being raised into the clouds, blessing his disciples and now seated on the throne. This familiar text tells us this familiar story. And yet as it tells us this familiar story of Jesus' exaltation, I want us to see that this exaltation is something unique. That phrase, the highest place, is actually the only time that Greek word occurs in the entire New Testament. It means he was super exalted. He went from hell at the cross to heaven. He went from separation from God to intimacy with God. He went from being despised and rejected to having all authority in heaven and on earth. In the crown of that exaltation, the climax of the song is the giving of a name. 
Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, Ascension Day, and gave him the name that is above every name. God gave him a name in his ascension. What is that name? Well, the Bible is filled with names for Jesus. Jesus, of course, the angel told Mary to give him, but there's also Christ, the name of Messiah, Emmanuel, wonderful counselor, prince of peace, mighty God, ancient of days, the door, the chief shepherd, the good shepherd, the great shepherd, the word, the light, the lamb, the bread, the life, the way, the truth, the life, the rock, the bridegroom, the cornerstone, the alpha, and the omega, on and on it goes. What is the name above every name? Well, the story, the song of Philippians 2 shows us what name we're talking about. That every time we'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. That is the name of the ascended Christ. Lord in Greek is Kyrie, which is the word the Greek translation would have used for the Hebrew Yahweh. In our Bibles, it's the capital L-O-R-D. That's the sacred name of God. And here in Philippians, we're told that Jesus, the carpenter from Nazareth, is capital L-O-R-D. This is echoing Isaiah 42. I am the Lord, Kyrie, Kyrie, that is my name. And Jesus has now, Jesus is Lord. And we see that's what's going on in Philippians 2 because a couple of chapters later in Isaiah, we have the same image that Philippians gives us. Isaiah 45, before me every knee will bow and by me every tongue will swear. And now in Philippians, Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. That the point of this song, this familiar song of a familiar story is that Jesus is Lord, that his name is above every name, that Jesus is the fulfillment of that third commandment. The name above every name is Jesus. That's Ascension Day's reminder. But the question is, in our everyday, is that true for us? Is Jesus the name above every name? A few months ago, a newspaper in Utah did a study or a survey of the Ten Commandments. And they asked people, actually this was in the U.S. and in the United Kingdom, to rank the commandments based on which ones they thought were still important and which ones they thought were not important. Do not murder, top of the list. Most people, about 95% thought that that was still relevant today. Makes you wonder about the 5%, doesn't it? Second from the bottom is the third commandment. In fact, in the United Kingdom, only 23% thought that that was still relevant today. In other words, more than three out of every four think that that doesn't matter anymore. Is Jesus the name above every name? Well, a linguistic professor uh, from Florida just did a study of U.S. cable television shows, watched the shows, and then counted up the number of times that there were swear words and vulgarities. They found that the number one vulgarity in cable TV was the F-bomb. If you don't know what that is, wonderful for you. The second biggest swear word was God. And in fact, the F-bomb was concentrated in a few shows by breadth. The number one swear word that writers like to use is in fact God and Jesus and Christ and Jesus Christ. Is Jesus the name above every name or is it the name below all names? This is pervasive and I think so much so that we even forget about it. I read this week um, a movie several years ago uh, produced by Steven Spielberg, E.T.'s you know, director, Jaws, that wonderful director, and then produced by, uh, directed by J.J. Abrams. It's called, um, well, actually I don't remember what it's called. Mary Jo, help me out here. Yeah, Super 8, that's it, because she watched it, I didn't, so I'm. <laughs> this pastor, it's a PG-13 rated movie, so this is something that if you're a 14-year-old, you're welcome to come to. And it's a story of some middle-aged kids, or middle-aged, middle school-aged kids, and there's an alien who comes, and they're making this movie of it. It's kind of a horror-type film, but not really. And this person counted in that movie how many times God's name was taken in vain. You don't want to guess a PG-13 movie? How many, how many times did you think? Anyone want to make a guess? No one? 500, Five, 500 would be impressive. It's actually, it's about around 100 when he stopped counting. PG-13, a film about some middle schoolers, Jesus, Jesus Christ, God. 
that is the thing that we use to entertain ourselves. And those who watch it, including Mary Joseph, I didn't even realize that. These things just go over our heads, don't they? Because it's the sea we swim in. And it's not just those times when we use God's name in those kind of derogatory ways. There's even more subtle but very direct ways, too, that Hollywood will use God's name in vain. If anyone watches the show Young Sheldon, anyone know what that show is? Episode last month, where there is a tornado coming and Young Sheldon, this is from the Big Bang Theory, kind of an earlier version, they hide in the bathroom and the tornado's shaking the house and the lights go out and the mother, who's an evangelical Christian, prays. And it's a beautiful prayer. She says, in the name of Jesus, I claim a hedge of protection around this family. And I pray in the name of Jesus that no harm will come. And young Sheldon says, pray harder. And they walk out at the end of the episode and their home is spared. But then the voice of older Sheldon intones over it. Actually, no houses in our neighborhood were destroyed. And my mom thought it had something to do with her. And that's the joke. Because, of course, in this worldview, it had nothing to do with her and nothing to do with the name of Jesus. It was just chance. In Hollywood, whether it is an interjection or whether it is a worldview, the name of Jesus is not the name above all names. It is the name below all names. It is the joke. It is the punchline. It is the swear word. And so I want us to think about how we are to hear this Ascension Day truth in our everyday. And the Catechism actually gives us three negative ways that we can break this commandment, because it's not just Hollywood. Notice what it says again, that we neither, to keep this, neither blaspheme nor misuse the name of God by, number one, cursing. That is, speaking against God's name. That's all the examples I've just given you. That's taking God's name and maligning the name and through it maligning God's person. And again, a a study about this, I just want to give you this. This is um, from a newspaper just a couple months ago. With the wide use of services like Netflix, people all over the world have access to cable and independent shows that employ more provocative language, which not only exposes more people to swearing, but may also make them feel like swearing is acceptable. And then to quote a Swedish researcher, not only are we hearing these words and experiencing them a lot, It's hard to shake off the feeling that what's on TV is okay. If our consumption of media is reflected in our OMGs and our texting, maybe we need to look again at the third commandment and to learn to re-reverence what has become commonplace. But There's a second way that we do this. It's not just through cursing, it's through perjury. Cursing is speaking against the name of God. Perjury is speaking falsely in the name of God. Now, we hear this word in the news a lot because of this Mueller investigation and then claims that some of our politicians are not always forthcoming in the truth and that maybe they'll be charged for perjury. Not just because they lie, but because they say, I swear to tell the truth, so help me God. We're familiar with that kind of perjury. But perjury is also using God's name cynically. It's using God's name as a means to an end, whether using it to cover a lie, a means to an end, or some other end. Some of you may have seen this bumper sticker that I read in a blog just last week. If Jesus had a gun, he'd still be alive today. Anyone see that bumper sticker? Now, of course, what's the bumper sticker showing? Well, it's meant to be humorous, right? It's kind of saying, I'm a Christian, I love Jesus, and I love guns, don't take either of my things away. And if you would ask the driver of this car, I'm pretty sure they would say, I'm not making a theological statement here because this is bad theology. Jesus doesn't need a gun. In fact, he says, I have legions of angels I could call. He wasn't killed because he wasn't strong enough. He was killed because it was God's pleasure. A gun wasn't the point. In fact, he told his disciples, put down your sword. I'm going to the cross. This is terrible, terrible theology. And I think the driver of the car knows that. And they would say, well, actually, my point isn't Jesus. My point is gun control. And that's the problem. Jesus is being used, his name, as a means to a political end. Individuals do that. Political parties do that. Both are a violation of the third commandment. Which brings us to the third way the catechism names for us unnecessary oaths. Speaking against God is cursing. Speaking falsely in God's name is perjury, speaking flippantly in God's name, are unnecessary oaths, when we don't need to do it, when we use God's name not to worship or to honor him, but for some other way. 
Some of you may have seen just last week, actually two days ago, a passenger on a Spirit Airlines flight to Las Vegas. Anyone see this? She uh, rushed onto the plane after it was closed, so they were going to remove her from the plane. She Facebook live streamed herself for about 18 minutes as they were trying to remove her. They made everyone else have to leave the plane. They arrested her. During the course of that, she used the F-bomb. She used the N-word. She used racial charge language against her passengers. She called the police people terrorists. But in the middle of the tirade, and I listened to it, she said this, Y'all are going to use Jesus' name, the Holy Spirit? She's talking about Spirit Airlines. That's got to change. Y'all need to be called something else. Y'all need to change y'all's name because nothing Holy Spirit about this airline. Don't use his name in vain. She said nothing. I'm a Christian. Now, I would suggest that rather than the airline using Jesus' name in vain, when a Christian in the public square with three million people watching behaves that way and speaks that way and then claims the name of Jesus as her Lord, I think actually that is the breaking of the third commandment. What does Jesus' ascension on Ascension Day mean in our everyday to guard our words? But in closing, it's not just to avoid those three negatives. The Catechism also tells us positively how we can live this out. And I'd like to close with that. Notice where the Catechism moves from don't do these things to what it tells us to do. First of all, we, it calls us to repent. I say repentance because the Catechism is very strong. Not only should we not use this language but we can't even tolerate it. It says that we neither blaspheme nor misuse the name of God. That's in the negative. Nor share in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. Does anyone work um, construction, Brigden Hills? You guys ever poured a cement pad in a hot day with some crew? Do they always say, jolly swell? Has anyone ever watched any of those cable TV shows? Anyone have Netflix? Anyone watch PG-13 movies? Maybe the catechism is being a little bit hyperbolic here, but what if it is such an important thing that it's not enough that we don't say it, but that we don't be silent bystanders, that we don't tolerate this sort of misuse of God's holy name in our lives. But it's not just repentance that God calls us to. He moves on to call us to reclaim and to rejoice in that name. Notice what it goes on to say. It requires that we use the holy name of God only with reverence and awe. So that we may properly, three things, confess him, pray to him, and praise him in everything we do. Drew and Brandon, you today confess Jesus' name. You did that with your words. But it's also something you have to do with your lives. That to actually honor the third commandment, it's not enough never to swear, or even never to watch TV shows where they swear, or never text OMG, It is that we confess Christ's name here in the church, but we also confess Christ's name in the way you live in college as a freshman, or the way that you do a business deal this Wednesday, or the way that you treat your roommate, that we confess Christ by living for Christ, that we pray to him. In other words, that we use this name and we say, in Jesus' name, amen, and that there's trust implicit in our prayer, that that's not a superstitious activity or a throwaway activity. In the name of Jesus, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we trust. And then finally, that we praise him in everything we do and say. The name of Jesus is not only not to be maligned, it is to be honored. Notice again of Philippians chapter 2. These same three things appear. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, the name in which we pray. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. In other words, we worship in heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess. Prayer and worship and confession, the same three things as the catechism. God is calling us an ascension day and every day to treat Christ's name in these ways. I'd like to close with just a, an image of this in our lives. I, this week, had a classical exam where we examined a candidate for ministry. I was reminded of a classical exam I had when I first came to Sioux Center. And at that, an elder spoke up and shared this little story that he used to work at a place with a coworker who every third word was a swear word. Anyone ever work in a place like that? I worked in a nursery too, yes. That's, every third word was a swear word for his coworker. And his coworker got cancer. And he called this Christian man to the hospital. 
And this Christian man who confesses the name of Jesus, who prays in the name of Jesus, and whose life was an offering of praise in Christ's name, met with his coworker and shared the gospel. And in that hospital room, this sailor of a speaker became a son of God. This Christian man left, and the nurse <clears throat> saw him later and said, what did you do to that man? He was changed. He was changed. Not just in his voice and speech, but from the inside out, through the name of Jesus. Ten years later, a nephew of the man who died, that man with cancer who was saved, met up with the same Christian man and said, what did you do to my uncle? And he shared the story, and that nephew also, ten years later, came to confess and to praise and to pray the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus, and may our lives and our words reflect this power. Friends, will you pray with me? Gracious God, we thank you on this Ascension Day weekend that Christ has all authority, and that authority is shown in this name above all names. This name that we close our prayers in, this name that we sing about in praise, this name that we confess in our lives, not just in our words. But I thank you with Drew and Brandon for the confession of that name they've made tonight. I pray that each of us that confess this name would honor it and that you would be glorified through us. For we pray in Jesus' name and all of us say, amen. We sing in the Psalter hymnals <clears throat> a song about this name we've just uh, been reminded of, all hail the power of Jesus' name. Number 471, stanza 1, 3, and 4. seated. As you are, we come to this name above all names, the Savior who is seated on the right hand of God, and we bring him our prayers, our lives, this world, and as we do, are there any prayer requests or praises to share tonight? Yeah, Nick. Uh, yeah, so we're praying for Haley Visser, who's in Belize for a couple of weeks with some Dort students. And so we want to pray for a, just a good trip there and for safety and for blessing through their work. <coughs> Other prayers? Yeah, Grant. Okay. You said, she, whose sister? Kelly. Oh, Kelly. Okay, I thought you said Shelly. I'm like, I don't see a Shelly. <laughs> Kelly's sister, Haley. Heart surgery later this week. So I pray for Haley. Okay. Other items for prayer? Yeah. Yeah. So the situation in Nicaragua continues to escalate. If you started with Social Security, some changes there, but it became violent, and now we um, yeah, just continue to see a great unrest, and, and I want to pray for God's hand over that country. 
If you're old enough, you remember the Civil War, Iran-Contra, um, and that those memories are still there. We want to pray that God does not let that country descend to that again. So, Good. other things. Okay, John's brother-in-law, you said Rick? Greg. Greg has stage four cancer, so we want to pray for Greg. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah, Levi. Farm rescue as we help family, farmers and ranchers and plant species and that may be real. Okay, so pray for farm rescue, a ministry that helps farmers, especially in a busy planting season. You said you had an accident? Okay, three cases. I'm going to pray for strength for those workers. Thank you. Good. Right. Good. If there's nothing else, let's, let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you this day, and once again we thank you that your name is a strong refuge that we can run to, that it is your name alone by which we may be saved. And that as we finish this prayer and even the quiet prayers we utter in our hearts this time, that we know you hear us and that we know you act in accordance with your good and perfect will. Heavenly Father, we lay before you the desires of our hearts. Maybe those things are at the tip of our tongues tonight. Those deep fears that we don't dare to mention in public. Those deep pains that maybe at times seem so overwhelming we don't even know where to turn. We have lost the words to pray. We thank you that you are a God who knows our hearts and who can turn our groanings into perfected prayers. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you also are a God who is near to the brokenhearted and we lay before you some of these situations of pain today. Heavenly Father, we do pray for Kelly's sister Haley as she goes into surgery. We pray that you would just watch over her in these coming days as she anticipates this, that you would give her a deep sense of peace even beginning tonight knowing that she is in your hand and Lord, that you would use the hands of the surgeons to bring healing to her heart and restoration to her. Heavenly Father, we do pray with John for his brother-in-law, Greg. We pray that as he battles stage four cancer and we do not know what yet what the future will hold on this side of heaven, we ask that you will walk beside him, that you would, if it's your will, do in our midst again a miracle, even as we saw today you did through those 72 workers you sent into your harvest field. We pray, Lord, that you who has all power and authority in the name of Jesus, would even startle us in this world with the use of that power to bring wholeness and healing. Father, we pray this not just for bodies broken by cancer, but also for nations. We lay before you the nation of Nicaragua, and we pray once again that you would restrain the forces of evil, that you would break the grip of those who have held power and used it to abuse your people. Heavenly Father, that you would give your church that is alive in Nicaragua and even the missionary presence that we've supported there, the gift of being salt and light, the gift of being agents of reconciliation and of pointing people beyond a president to the King of kings and Lord of lords who is crowned with glory. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've called each of us to serve in this world with broken bodies and broken nations, but also in other places. And we thank you with Haley Visser, the opportunity to serve in Belize. We pray for safety for her and her team. Pray that you would bless the work that they do. We pray that you would help them to see in a new way your kingdom coming in and through them. And that as they come back, they also would challenge us to be open witnesses for that kingdom as well. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the professions of faith of tonight. We thank you also for the way that you will use each of us in this week. And we pray that we would be ambassadors of your name that are faithful and true. Father, we give our offerings now also for the ministry of the Back to God Hour, we do pray that you would use that ministry to bring your gospel here and around the world, that you would give us generous hearts, and that you would remind us again that your kingdom indeed is coming, for Christ indeed is King. So Father, receive our prayers, receive our lives. Heavenly Father, we also pray that you would in this week continue to give times of planting. As farmers, we just cry out for your provision for that. And we thank you for Farm Rescue as they also walk beside these farmers in a busy season. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that with them we can serve our neighbor in love. So receive our prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. We do give our offerings now for the Back to God Hour. And as we do, we're going to be invited to watch a video which describes a little bit of that ministry that we're supporting tonight.
Back to God Ministries. In International started in 1939. Started out as a simple radio program. Today, we're in 10 major world languages. God has really blessed our ministry, given us opportunities all over the world to share the gospel, to help those who want to follow Jesus Christ do that better. And we're doing this to strengthen local churches. A girl in Ouagadougou, her Muslim boss, said to her, if you are going to continue to go to church, I will sack you from my job. And it was so. Some nights people write to you and you just want to cry. How do we as broken people interact with other broken people and find a way to live in relationship? Those are just tensions that are always there. We create content using indigenous languages. People feel like they can really share what's on their hearts, you know, the challenges they have, the struggles that they have, and their desire for knowing God in a deeper way. She listened to our broadcast and said, I've listened to the broadcast and I want to give my life to Jesus. new media, We'll get people from Africa writing and New Zealand and all over that, you know, people write to us. And it's just really exciting to get to, you know, be involved in people's lives in this big global church community. We're not just doing this ministry on our own. We see this as partnership with you. Without your gifts, without your prayers, this ministry would be impossible. Thank you, and we ask you to continue to work with us to share the good news of Jesus Christ around the world. Again, that's one of the ministries we can support directly in a time like this, but also our ministry shares that we take as a portion of our morning offerings go to the agencies of the Christian Reformed Church, including things like the Back to God Hour. As we finish the service, we will be invited to profess our faith, and so I invite you to stand to do that. And this evening, we profess our faith through another question answer from the Heidelberg Catechism, question answer 32, which asks us, but why are you called Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in his anointing. I am anointed to confess his name, to present myself to him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. Jesus is the name above all names. We confess that name and he will reign. Let's sing together. Jesus shall reign, number 412, stanza 1 and 3.
receive God's blessing in our closing song for this Sabbath day is number 634, Father, We Love You. And after that, I invite you to go to the fellowship hall and to have a time of celebration with those couples approaching marriage. But first of all, this blessing from the book of Numbers, chapter 6. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. And the text goes on to say, so they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Thank you.